first, I'll tell you what happened to my friend. We'll call him John. Also, a little background. The three of us work together on a graveyard shift. What we do during downtime, of which there is a lot. We make different noises and calls and goof off. This will play an important part in the first two stories. John walked away from the vehicles with my other friend. We'll call him Pete. They walked out the dam next to the lake out there. It runs north-south along the east side of the man-made lake there. You can walk along the top and look down to the right or east, and that is a large ravine. There is a valve down there, in fact, to empty the lake into the Tuxchani River in case the lake gets too full. It was here that John actually parted ways from Pete and moved down into the ravine. He found the valve, as he'd heard it was down there. Then he proceeded to move east further into the ravine, which was fairly wooded. As he walked, he began to whistle at Pete. He promptly was answered with three powerful wood knocks. When he described the story to me, he said it sounded as if a large branch was being beat against a tree. He kept whistling and received these knocks in return. He was under the assumption that they were from He was under the assumption that they were coming from Pete. He said he believed they were coming from the south of the ravine up on an artificial ridge created by the overburden removed to create the lake. He assumed Pete had walked out onto the ridge and was playing around. He actually got irritated as he expected Pete to whistle back and he didn't know what the heck he was doing with the wood knocks. He climbed back up the ravine and stood at the top of the dam to get a look at Pete to question him. It was at that time that John saw that Pete had actually gone back to the vehicles over a thousand yards away and southwest of not just his position but where he had heard the knocking. Pete would later say upon discussion that he had never even went into the woods. He turned back when John went in because he didn't fancy getting ticks. Simultaneously during that event, while Pete had been at the vehicle, he had his own experience. He heard a hoot or a howl. Now one of the calls or noises we make at work, which is called the whale call. We try to mimic a humpback whale singing, including the stairwell we call the aquarium, for its fantastic acoustics. Pete assumes that this was John and returns the call. He is answered by the same call. This happens three more times before Pete doesn't get a response. The call came more east of Pete's position and just south of where John heard the knocks. Later upon discussion, not only was John not there, he didn't do the whale call all that day. It was after all this that I arrived, and when we moved just northwest of the lake, about a mile or two to set up for shooting, we were just doing some target practice. While we were setting up, I hear a very low rumble come from the southeast. I stop dead. What I'm doing, and I look up to see John looking me dead in the eye. A little confused, I say, is that thunder? He responded with no. I checked before we left camp and there isn't a lightning strike within 200 miles. We didn't think too much of it. We did our first bit of shooting which was immediately south of our position. When we stopped we removed hearing protection. I again heard it but it was moving west, towards our field of fire. It also sounded closer. This was the last I heard it. John said he heard it for the rest of the time we were there. When we packed up and left, he said it was really close and almost in our line of fire. Doesn't sound the way any animal should act. John also noted it was very bassy and he could hear and he could feel it in his chest. He described them as short powerful huffs, almost. I don't know how to describe it really. He just made the sound. Later, me and John were talking about it and he told me what happened. I heard wood knocks and immediately thought Sasquatch or Skunk Ape or whatever they are in these parts. He didn't really acknowledge what I said at that time. A couple hours later though, I get a text saying, this is what we heard. There was a link to the Gulf Coast Bigfoot Research Organization, the recordings page specifically. Supposedly the recordings were all from our general area. 
He said he spent the rest of the night not sleeping, with a thousand yard stare trying to keep it tearing. First time poster, long time lurker here. I came across this thread and thought I would share a story I've heard many times growing up in the Georgia Deer Woods. I'm actually quite surprised that there seems to be a lot of these stories that are coming from Hancock County. Not saying I believe one way or the other, but I just find these stories interesting. Especially the ones from Hancock, because that is where this story took place. Back in the early 70s, my dad and all of his half-brothers hunted something like a 3,000 acre tract behind the DeVero store. The story goes that they were longbow hunting, or at least Archie White was possibly could have been beer drinking and night road hunting to knowing my family. Anyway, it has been said that Archie headed out for the evening with a longbow and quiver and a couple cans of beer. My dad has been adamant every time the story was told that while he was drinking, he was not drunk. Sitting on the ground, backed up to a tree, he dozed off when he awoke. There was this creature standing directly over him ugly, hairy, and mean looking, and awful smelling. On the other end of this story, from the brothers' perspective, just at dark from their camp on a power line, they hear screams and see Archie running for them, no bow in hand, just holding what was left of the quiver and a couple of arrows. They say that to say he was shook up as an understatement, and more like he was freaked out to the point that he was, for the lack of a better word, crazy out of his mind. He was screaming about what had happened, all the while throwing his gear in the trunk of his car. They hunted out of cars back then. He told all of his brothers that he was leaving and they were crazy if they stayed, and that he would never hunt again. But he never did. Uncle Archie passed away some years later on his deathbed. He told my dad to come to him so he could talk to him about the incident many years ago. He said he took a lot of kidding about that over the years, but he wanted to tell my dad that what he saw and what had happened was the truth. Just my story about the Hancock Deer Woods. In 1977, while fishing, my Uncle Bill, my Uncle Shep, and my Aunt Cora, now deceased, and my mother Mary, were fishing the original Loop Road area of the Tamimi Trail. They were all fishing in this heavily wooded swampy area, just talking and laughing as family members do when enjoying time together. It was a sunny day, but the overhanging tree line made it cool and filtered the sunlight. Loop Road has loads of wildlife and is in the Everglades National Preserve, home to the Misuki Indians. Loop Road is an excellent place to fish for bass and bream, or just take photos of nature and its keep. One Saturday at approximately 2 p.m., Uncle Bill says he ran out of night crawlers, so he decides to go back to the car, which was parked a few feet away from where everyone was fishing. He said he unlocked the trunk of the 1977 Pontiac Grand Prix and grabbed the small plastic container of night crawlers and began to close the trunk when all of a sudden he saw a figure some 40 feet away walk out of the tree line on the same side of the road everyone was fishing on. It stopped mid-stride and looked at him. As he peered along the trunk lid, it stood looking at my Uncle Bill for three seconds and quietly walked across the dirt road and into the tree line, swamp on the other side. Uncle Bill described it as being five feet tall and having long arms to the knees and was covered in a long thin fur. He said you could see the light colored skin through the fur. Bill said that the face was flat, with a flat nose and that the hair was around the eyes and below them and around the mouth, he says the eyes seem like one dark color. In Uncle Bill's words, it scared the hell out of him. But he also said the most amazing thing was that this thing never made a sound. It didn't crack a branch as it walked out of and into the swamp. 
Uncle Bill said he made everyone quickly pack up their poles and hop into the car, and he quickly drove off. He has never been back to Loop Road before his passing. Myself and my brother always go out there today, but we have never seen anything. Please know that Uncle Bill passed away in 1997. This happened this past Thursday evening, right before Destination Truth comes on at 9 p.m. in my time zone. I am staying at my brother's place two doors down from where I live because I'm getting new floors put in my condo. For those that don't know, I live on a bluff that overlooks a river on the edge of a city in South Carolina. My brother was on the deck looking at Jupiter when I saw him through the window motion for me to come out. I went out and noticed a plane flying low overhead, but could still hear scuffling and pebbles hitting the tree line over this noise. My brother did a couple of owl calls. Then I tried my barred owl call, that is when the deer jumped over the edge of the bluff and cut across the yard, at an angle going towards the outdoor light. It was being followed by something that was below the edge of the bluff. It must have seen us and got royally pissed because it hissed. Now, the edge of the bluff is about 30 feet from the deck, and I would guess this creature was 10 feet below that gradually sloped edge. But you could hear it very plainly, because the plane was gone by that time. A few seconds later, we got a whiff of a sewage less sulfur smell, but it evaporated pretty quickly. Now what do you think it was? Will a puma that isn't supposed to be in South Carolina hiss like that? and put off a smell that tomcats will? Will they come that close to city limits looking for game if it's a puma? I never saw what it was. I just could tell what the direction that the hiss came in. The moon was not very high yet and the outdoor light was a good 50 feet away. I looked this morning but couldn't find any prints or sign of struggle. It hasn't rained in weeks. I assume the pebbles could have rolled down the slope hitting trees and the boulders on the way down to the water's edge and game trail if something was scrambling up the hill. The only thing that I can think of that can hiss like that is a big cat, but I didn't think they would wander that close in. Maybe it was following the river because of the drought and other prey that would be doing the same thing. My name is Steve Keller. I am from Atlanta, Georgia. My brother and I bought about 30 acres of land about a year ago on Pressman's Home Road in Rogersville, Tennessee, very close to the intersection of Highway 66 and Highway 94. It is pretty mountain land and we hope to build cabins and eventually retire there. The land is very wooded with just several old logging roads going through it. Last week, Dave and I spent three days clearing trees at the top of his property. We also set up a couple tents to camp there. The first night, there was nothing unusual. The second, about ten, we heard this very loud calling or howling not too far from our tents. It sounded like maybe a couple hundred uh, yards away on the next parcel of land, which is very rugged. I started up and everything got silent and a minute later we heard a similar sound coming from way off in the other direction. This went back and forth several times. Then it broke into an ongoing howling session for about five minutes. I have camped many times and I have heard all kinds of howling, owls, coyotes, dogs, etc. But I have never heard anything like this in my life, nor had Dave. We were getting ready to pack up and get the heck out of there but we were both exhausted from cutting trees all day, so we decided to stick it out. It really freaked me out though, knowing the only thing protecting us from whatever it was was this nylon tent. I finally went back to sleep. The next morning, Dave told me he hadn't slept out all night, and it started back again down at the bottom of our valley about 3 a.m. Apparently, it was very loud, and our neighbor's dog went crazy barking at it. I don't know how I slept through it other than I was exhausted from the day before. 
The next day, we discussed it and how it had really freaked us out. We had the idea that we would try to record it the next night on our iPhones. The next night, we did not hear it. Just an owl. We left the next day. Okay, a couple of things that are unusual that add to the picture. One, since we bought this beautiful property, we have seen virtually no wildlife on it. No squirrels, no deer, no rabbits, no chipmunks, no nothing. The only animal that we have ever seen in over a year is one turkey and a couple of snakes. It is such a pretty place with so much vegetation that we were really starting to wonder what was wrong with it that no animals would come there. Was it a toxic dumping ground? Something had to be wrong with it. So it was very unusual to hear any kind of animal howling on the property at night. Number two, a couple from Florida owned both the two lots next to us. This sounded like it was where the howling was coming from that night. They along with the father-in-law were down this spring and trying to stake out their property lines up between the mountains. The father-in-law was further up the mountain when a rock about the size of a baseball came from out of nowhere, flew over his head, and was headed for Carl. He yelled for Carl to duck, and the rock just missed him by inches. Originally, we all thought it must have been a rock that came loose from the top of the mountain and came rolling down. The likelihood of that is very unlikely because of all the trees. Since our experience the other night, I am really wondering if maybe it could be a Bigfoot living on Carl's land which is very rough terrain. Could it be that a Bigfoot threw a rock at them that day? Could it also be that the reason there are no other animals anywhere on the property, that there is something living there that is scaring them off? I listened to some Bigfoot recordings on the internet when I got home, and several of them sounded very similar to what I, we heard that night. We are going back in a couple of weeks, but I doubt we will camp in the mountain again. It's just too freaky for me. I used to work with this guy who would always go walking with his dog in the woods of Windsor, Massachusetts very late at night. He always used to say that the quiet of the late night is very relaxing. He'd always tell stories about weird things that he heard or animals he'd seen. But one morning he came into work and he was very shaking up, like something terrible had happened. We asked him what was wrong and it took him a moment to answer. I was out with my dog last night in the woods. We were walking along the trail and there was a hill in front of us. I hear something coming down the hill which startled me. So I looked up and saw what looked to be a man coming down the hill. That scared me at first, but as it got closer I noticed it was covered in dark fur and was taller than an average man. It had a terrible musky odor to it. That burned my nostrils. As it came down the hill it noticed me and my dog. My dog's hair was standing up straight as an arrow, and I put my hand in a fist and brought it back to be ready to defend myself. Not two seconds later, it let out this very loud howl and ran away on its hind legs to the west faster than anything I had ever seen in my life. We all stood there, eyes wide and jaws dropped, waiting for him to say something else. He finished with, I know one thing, that's the last time I ever go in those woods. And he went to his area and got to work. Let me know what you guys think. March 2nd, 2007. The witness had just gotten off work early and was traveling down 200 north. One of his co-workers was traveling in front of him, a good 300 feet or so, when he noticed that he had swerved rather fast. So the witness expected a deer to come running out, but that was not the case. What he saw was a black furred animal on two legs walking all hunched over. He quickly tried avoiding it, but he believes he clipped it with his back end. He stopped, not sure what had just happened, and started looking for his driver's side mirror. He didn't see anything for a few seconds, but then something stood up right behind his explorer. Terrified, the witness rolled down his window and could see the fear on his friend's eyes. 
who confirmed that he had seen the same creature. His friend started back to see it and heard it howling. The witness looked through the windshield and saw the creature was trying to stand up on two legs again, but kept falling over. It eventually got on all fours and ran off into the woods. The two men then got out of their vehicles to look around but did not see anything. However, they did notice a large, fat moose gerbil looking rodent on the side of the road which was not afraid of them at all. They picked it up and put it off into the grass. My Bigfoot sighting occurred on our dairy farm in Shenango County south of Bering Bridge, New York in May 1961 when I was 14 years old. The sighting was around 1 p.m. in the afternoon in our family hillside woodlot which was made up of primarily oak, maple, cherry, and peach trees. At the time I was active in Boy Scouts and having my own campsite was a priority. I located my campsite next to a small spring now, to a 14-year-old boy, this meant all the comforts of a home and a campsite. Plenty of wood for campfires, plenty of water, and plenty of protection against the elements in this section of woodland. I was going to the campsite when I heard a rustling noise at the spring. Thinking it might be a deer coming in for a drink, I moved as quietly as I could in the underbrush. Instead of a deer, about 50 to 100 feet from me, up rose this coal-black form looking directly at me. At first, I couldn't figure out what was looking at me. My brain just couldn't sort it out. It wasn't a bear. In the shade of the trees, its eyes reflected a brilliant yellow, and its coat was shiny black. Very broad shoulders, no neck to speak of, and its head was rounded like a human's. What bothered me was I could not discern a face. It seemed covered in hair. The eyes seemed to be peeking out of hair that fell over its face. Its arms were at its side, and I could not see below its torso. As brush covered its lower half, so I could not see its hands or feet, it had a very broad trunk. It would estimate its height to be six feet. It just stood there swaying side to side looking at me, as if to say, what am I looking at? Just as I was. It never made any sound. Now, I heard of Bigfoot. Old Dad had a subscription to a true magazine, and I had read Ivan Sanderson's stories, Jerry Crew, Ray Wallace, and John Green, but Bigfoot lived in the Pacific Northwest, not the East. When it dawned on me that I was looking at a Bigfoot, sheer panic and fear gripped me. I blasted out of there like a rifle shot. I ran down through the woods to a four-strand barbed wire fence that separated the woodlot from a Christmas tree plantation and cleared it easily in one jump. At this point, I lost my sweater that I had tied around my waist. It had warmed up considerably that day. I continued to run through our Christmas tree plantation, cleared another fence, and when I reached an open pasture, I looked back, and nothing was following me. I made it back to our farm buildings in record time, about a half mile from the sighting location, when I realized I had lost my sweater. If I recall correctly, my parents and younger brother were away at the time on a shopping trip in Binghamton, New York, and I was by myself. I decided to go back for my sweater, so I went back to our farm shop and got our trusty Stephen Single shot shotgun for courage. I knew it would not kill, let alone stop a squash, and went back after my sweater. As I approached the fence where I lost it, I could hear something walking up the fence line and must have known I had come back because it sounded like it was stomping branches as if to say, don't come near me, stay away. I found my sweater neatly draped over the strand of the fence and tried to follow the Sasquatch up the fence line. There were several times I knew I was getting near him but could not bring myself to get closer. Finally, I gave up my pursuit and went home. As I review this event, I would say I probably surprised a juvenile who was drinking at the spring. I would estimate it was a male, as I saw no breast or female features. Regarding the hair hanging down over his face, I note that Lauren Coleman has written about this feature of the Ohio Woolly Booger or other eastern sightings. It could be that he came up so fast from getting drink.
that he didn't have time to slick his hair back. I have told few people about that event, and later I told my family I had seen a bear. I note that many I note that many after a sighting are afraid to go back to the sighting location. I was never afraid to be alone in the woods. However, I noticed that in early February or March, I would feel at times as if I were being watched. However, it seemed that it was the only time of the year that I felt uncomfortable. Since I moved to the Northwest in 1987, I have kept up my investigation. However, I have seen nothing like this since. Yet, yeah, I have experienced a couple of incidents where I believe I heard howls or calls. For most of my life, I lived in a small town in Fairfield County, Connecticut. I wasn't new to scary stories about ghost intruders and stalkers, but what I saw was far from that. It all started in January of 2011. I was waiting at the bus stop earlier than I usually would, so nobody was walking down the street. The morning felt off, but I shrugged it off as I thought it was the loneliness, but that quickly turned to fear as I heard a scream that sounded like a lowered pitch, stretched out yell of a coyote. It immediately sent shivers down my whole body. I wished the story would end there, but it didn't. After school, I would usually hang out with my friends. For anonymity, I will call them Liam and Charlotte. Liam, Charlotte, and I would proceed with our usual shenanigans down by the brook in the woods. There was a small bridge that would lead to a thicker woods that we'd go to build teepees and little forest and just hang out. As we were halfway through the bridge, I heard that same, bone-chilling yell. What the hell was that? Coco asked, sounding concerned. We all looked at each other and decided to call it a day, as we quickly walked out into the light. We went up the snowy hill, that's when it caught our eye. A eight to nine foot tall creature that had brown hair and a hulk-like build covered in hair. What was shocking is that it ran across the brook in two steps. The brook was about 32 feet across. We froze at what we saw and ran up the hill across the other side of the bank. The footprints in the snow were bigger than any humans. I can't find any explanation of what it could have been. It couldn't be a bear or a human. Not even an escaped ape. This incident still freaks me out to this day, although I still go into the woods. I've never seen the creature or have heard any other accounts of this creature, so I'm hoping others can relate and give some closure and prove that I'm not insane. Well, the story I'm going to tell needs a little foundation. I was 15 the year this happened. I'm Native American and I live in the northern Nevada in a rural area so I grew up near animals and the outdoors and I was a boy scout so I knew how to identify most of the Nevada and Idaho wildlife. But this story I'm going to tell just ruined the outdoors for me. Every time I go camping or hunting I will think of this every time I smell garbage or a skunk. But when this happened I was hunting with my brother my two uncles and my dad. We were going on a three night hunting trip. Where we were going had rivers, valleys, canyons, cliffs, and forests. Where we were camping was on the edge of the woods in a valley. It was our annual campsite. In the valley was a river that cut through the middle and ran into a natural lake that held trout, bass, and white fish. When we had nothing to do, we would spend our time swimming or fishing. The water was cool and clear and attracted a lot of wildlife. I once watched a mountain lion and her cub drink the water. I heard all these stories about mountain lion attacks, but they are timid and shy. It was the second evening when we were sitting at the camp by the fire, joking and laughing when we were punched in the face with a putrid odor. It smelled like a garbage dump on a warm day. That was sprayed by a skunk. Then my uncle said, in a scared tone, Let's go into the camper. I just did what he said and laid down and went to sleep. It must have been around 1.30 in the morning when I awoke. To hear our trailer rocking and 
the same odor that we smelled earlier. I was confused at the rocking. At first, I thought it was a cow that was pushing its head against the side of the trailer, then thought of the look of my uncle's face and it sent chills on my spine. I tried to go back to sleep when I heard footsteps on the roof of the camper. I needed to use the bathroom, so I grabbed my 22 250 and slowly opened the door and glanced around a little bit. Then I took off for the side of the camper. When I stopped and looked at the roof of it, there was a black figure that was crouched down and staring at me with red glowing eyes. I was scared to death, so I fired around in the air to scare it off. It hopped from the position onto the ground and bolted for the tree line. When it got there, it looked back and let out the ugliest, most blood-curdling cry I've ever heard, and I wished to never hear that cry again. I still go hunting in those woods, but have never went out at night or near that spot again. Hello. I am writing to your website because of some strange going-ons about the place I own here in Prescott, Yavapi County, Arizona. We have the remnants of what used to be a working ranch from years ago. Some living livestock from those days, a few horses, a few Brahma, a couple of goats out there, and a longhorn I won in a bar fight in Mexia, down in Limestone County, Texas. And recently we think we have a Bigfoot around. We used to winter horses for people around these parts who were snowbirds, but no more because of the mystery disappearances that happen here. In fact, lots of mysterious things like that happen around the place, especially as fall nears and the weather cools, like September, October, and November. Nothing happens in summer out here. One notable incident was the disappearance of one of my best dogs, part pit bull slash shepherd Mick. He wasn't afraid of anything and was great watchdog for the lower pasture. He guarded the grazing stock and two sheep we used to have and the goats from the local mountain lions and bobcats. Now, you may say the dog wandered off, but he was 10 years old and never left sight of the main house. He was a devoted dog. Some have said a bear came in the forest at night and took him, but... My middle son found him exactly 14 feet up in the crotch of a pinion pine tree with his neck snapped. No teeth marks were found, no bear claw marks, no mountain lion tears, just a broken neck and tossed up into that tree. Or if not tossed, someone must have put the dog's body up in that pinion, which my son had trouble reaching. We all tried to explain that one. Now onto the sheep. I bartered with a half-breed for a ram and an ewe, and had them down in the grazing pasture along with the stock, horses, goats, and such. We only had them for a short while and they disappeared. For a while, we thought the previous owner snuck back here loading up the two, carried them off, but my wife ran into the fellow in the hardware store in town and talked to him about the disappearance. He came home that day with my wife together and we went looking for a sign. We found nothing that day, and I don't believe he had anything to do with the sheep disappearance. He told me a far out story that got me thinking though, which is why I looked up Bigfoot on the internet. Anyway, he told me of a place up in the Sierra, Prieta. Pandoresa Forest, where this Yavapi Indian woman ran her small flock of sheep into the company of a young cousin, a blue merle coolie and a border collie that kept her flock together at night, fending off attacks by mountain lions and bobcats, sometimes wolverines. This one season, the woman and her cousin were bringing down the flock down of the mountains from grazing. It was late October. Snows were expected. She said she was not feeling well and laid down in a grassy meadow to rest, but woke up when she heard the sheep bleeding, her cousin yelling, and the dogs loudly onto something. The woman, sheep herder, said, escaping with a big ewe under his arm, the hairy man tried to fend off the biting dogs. Kick the one coolie dog. All to hell. This might be what befell my dog. 
She called off the dogs and watched the hairy man disappear into the pines with his prize. He explained that a hairy man to her was what we call Bigfoot or Sasquatch. She only told the story once to an elder and she won't speak of it anymore, but he mentioned they come down from the north in winter. Hearing the sheep hoarder's story, putting two and two together, my sons, the half-breed, and I pretty much decided that we must have a rogue Bigfoot living somewhere near the property. I don't mind that so much. We don't mind sharing some fruit off our trees with him, but stealing a man's stock is another thing. I don't expect to put up with that. After reading up on your website, my boys and I, along with other dogs, packed a rifle in a scabbard and rode out recently in the morning during Thanksgiving week and covered the whole western stretch of the property line, looking for a sign. You would laugh. We looked like a posse in a bee western. We worked the edge of the tree line for about two hours looking for a trail. We found one that led deep into the forest, a section none of us have ridden before. We worked the horses through there in a round thick brush. Soon we came to a stream and stopped to gather our bearings and water the horses. Dismounting, I thought I heard someone cough. I asked and nobody heard it but me. My horse jerked up, snorted and became uneasy. Sensing something none of us could see, the other mounts followed. All of us were focusing on keeping the horses under control as they danced about, bucking, kicking, and snorting. My sons thought mountain lion. I wasn't sure. We stood together there by the stream listening, calming the horses when the dogs started looking towards the thicket of thangled brush. Then the barking started in earnest, and they took off. Still, we couldn't see anything, but by now we all expected the dogs to tree a mountain lion. We couldn't follow. The brush was too thick, but the dog noise seemed to be about 20 yards into this thick brush and brambles. We kept calling and calling. Finally, the dogs returned and then took off again. Pretty soon, the dogs returned with tongues hanging out, breathing heavy. We leashed the dogs up and took them and led the horses down to the stream. The dogs settled down, but the horses didn't. And as we were making an effort to saddle up again, that is when it happened. There came this howl that lengthened into a scream that at first sounded like a Brahma fart, low and guttural, and drug out and ending up into a high-pitched drone like a woman screaming bloody murder. My body reacted with a chill. The goosebumps, mainly because the scream was coming from very close, somewheres in that thicket of brambles where the dogs had been. The scream was long and kind of dragged out, the kind of noise that gets your attention real fast. The half-breed yelled, Soyoko, which means Bigfoot, as he pulled the rifle out of the scabbard. By now, the horses were almost impossible to control. Then it got quiet. Not a sound, no birds, no crickets, no nothing. Everything was still, except for the horses. The dogs were now cowering between my legs and their ears pricked towards the thicket. Then, in the distance, we heard another scream. It must have come from across the next valley. Now, we are figuring there is fixing to be two of these Bigfoot. And I felt fear for the first time. The dogs started whining. My grown boys hurriedly saddled up. We followed and took off down the trail, heading at a full gallop, all the way home, a good hour later. Ain't never heard nothing like that vocalization before, and I've heard plenty coyote, plenty wolves and elks buggle, but never nothing like that before, and it wasn't no mountain lion scream. It was four times as powerful, if that was warning from a Bigfoot. We got the message.
Having lived in the area for more than four years, I had become accustomed to and familiar with driving my ATV, a Honda 450 Foreman, in and around the Daniel Boone National Forest. I was 22 years old of age and I was dating a local girl who lived in that county her entire life. We will call her Pam. We left my house one October night, traveled to the end of my ridge road which is gravel, then continued on the dirt logging road, no longer in use at the time, which is privately owned. This road, of course, was wide enough to have at one time accommodated trucks and machinery used for logging. This old road goes for maybe a mile to a mile and a half eastward before splitting into three separate roads, each having several arteries branching from them. We stayed on the eastward path that runs into the Daniel Boone National Forest. From this point, there is an old house trail that the locals use for their equine excursions. We had traveled the entire horse trail and all the logging roads many times. I felt intimately familiar with every nook and cranny of these paths offered. Pam and I motored down the horse trail at a leisurely pace due to the narrowness of the trail among the thick forest trees. This, coupled with many twists and turns of the horse trail, one could rarely exceed 8 to 10 miles per hour. I know this was because the ATV had a digital MP3 readout that was a backlit for night travel. After two to three hundred yards, we came upon a small pond that sits on the south side of the trail. This was a favorite spot of mine. Many times I would travel to this spot at night, turn off my lights and engine and just sit there and gaze at the stars and take in all the smells and the sound effects the forest offers. I saw my first shooting star while gazing up in the fall sky the year before in this very spot. This small, circular pond sits in a very tiny clearing of the forest just off the horse trail, with the tree line only about 20 feet from the water's edge all the way around. I pulled around the side of the pond opposite the trail, under a clear and half-moonlit sky. I turned off the engine and lights. I was oblivious that we had just parked near an entity that did not want us there. Fortunately. Before we could even lift our butts off the seat to get off the ATV, there was a tremendous roar that came out from the tree line directly behind us, probably no more than 40 to 50 yards away. I was instantly terrified as this was a sound I had never heard. It was loud and near. Pam screamed as I started up the ATV and headed back down the trail toward home. Luckily, the trail back out of there lay right in front of us. Holding on to me from behind, Pam remained silent as we made our escape. As quickly as I could, and without hitting any trees, we made our way back to the logging road, a few hundred yards away. I never remember turning my body to look back, but I looked from side to side many times. This model ATV has three headlights, two are in a fixed position on the four-wheeler's front, and the third is attached to the handlebars and thus turned from side to side several dozen times as we made our way back to the logging road. From the pond to the logging road, I saw nothing unusual on either side of the tree line, neither directly nor in my peripheral. But remember, the horse trail is on forest property and the trees much more densely populated. Even with the ATV's lights, and half moon my vision would have been severely limited. Neither of us shouted, spoke to one another during the retreat of the horse trail. During this time, I remember telling myself over and over that it must be some kind of animal or even bird that had made that awful noise. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, we reached the logging road. It greeted us with a straighter, wider path and sparsely populated trees. Now comes to the recollection that haunts my dreams to this day. Having reached the logging road without seeing or hearing any signs that we were being pursued, and not wanting to wreck of course, I only moderately quickened our pace. Now, on the south side of the trail something caught my eyes. 
I saw a dark figure running parallel to the road directly to my left about 30 yards. This thing was running on two legs. It looked like a very tall and very large human form. I looked directly at it for a few seconds, turned back to look at the road, and then turned to look at its direction once more to discover it was still there keeping pace with us. During the second and final glance at this being, which also just lasted a couple seconds, it was one of those moments in my life where you wonder if what you are experiencing is real or just a dream. I looked down at my large digital backlit speedometer, 22 miles per hour. Finally, a moderately sharp bend in the south of the trail. I had to slow a little. As the road straightened again, I floored it and for the first time, I turned my body to look to the left and a little behind to see if the curve to the left had allowed the creature an advantage, in case it was upon me or even in front of me. Nothing. It was not in close proximity to my left or rear. I even scanned the trees to my right. Nothing. I cocked my head to the side and yelled over to the sound of the engine, Pam, did you see it? These being the first words I had spoken since the encounter. She must have thought my abrupt acceleration was due to the fact that beyond the sharp turn in the trail we just passed, the road did become more straight and smooth. Her response in my ear was, I didn't see anything. Did you see something? I said no, with intentions of telling her everything once we reached my house. I slowed my pace and within minutes we were on the gravel road which led home. We went over the experience again and again that night, but I never told her what I saw. I sold my four-wheeler and moved into the city the next summer of 99. I purchased another ATV in 2000. I bought a trailer and pulled my ATV to the 49 exit off I-75 and do my riding in Laurel and Rockcastle counties. I hauled my ATV back to the area I saw the creature on a summer day in 2001. I was alone. I went to the pond and stood on the bank for a few minutes. I skipped a few rocks and then left. It was a beautiful day. As a naturalist with a particular interest in mammals, I have been investigating reports of unexplained predators and stock killing in southern and western Victoria, Australia for some time. I am not associated with any research group with a focus on cryptic animals, but with other independent researchers as appropriate. In the last few years, I have been given two reports of what appear to be hair-covered man-like animals in my research area. Intellectually, I have great problems with the idea of such animals occurring in Australia, but as I trust and respect the informants regarding these two reports, I thought it was best to make you aware of them. The first report I wish to lodge came from a work colleague of mine and took place in the early 1990s. Michael and his wife, both educated health professionals, and five-year-old son observed a meter high approximately 3.3 foot tall, hairy hominid at close range from several seconds near, for several seconds near their house in the bush a few kilometers near, in the bush a few kilometers north of Ballarat. The sighting was made late in the day, but in good light and initially at the range of only several meters. The beast ran away from them at a great speed, a speed they felt no human could move at, while it was quite short when compared to an adult human, it seemed quite heavily built and its forelimbs appeared to be disproportionately long. The hair was all over its body and about 5 centimeters long, approximately 2 inches, and the same length on the head and dark brown in color. The face was not seen and the ears were not noted. It ran from where they had disturbed it near the entrance to their drive diagonally across the dirt road that services the district, into a pine plantation and crashed through the undergrowth. The ground was too hard for tracks. It made no sound nor left any odor. Interestingly enough, at the time their son said he had seen it before. Now, however, 
He has absolutely no memory of that event and his parents don't like to refer to it. The other event related to me took place in the Otway Ranges west of Geelong near Tomahawk Creek. The observer who wishes to remain anonymous told me that in about 1989, he and three other mates all in their late teens were heading off for a night on the town in Kolak in a battered sedan. It was already after dark so they were making good pace along the gravel road through the state forest so as not to waste too much beer drinking time. Descending a steep hill it was necessary to break and gear down before ascending the coming hill. As they got to the bottom of the gully, an enormous man-shaped animal started to cross in front of them, but stopped and retreated. My informant, who was a passenger in the left front seat and the two lads in the back seat, all saw the animal and were in shock for a few seconds, but not the driver. The passengers all panic and beg the driver to get moving. The driver thought at first they were joshing, but soon got the message. None of these boys wanted to talk about it, and I could get my informant to discuss it only once. They had never heard any talk about such animals in their district before or since. The animal was described as much taller than a man, maybe 2.2 meters tall, approximately 7 feet tall, and very broad with arms proportionally much longer than a human's arms, but legs compared to torso roughly the same as human. It had no real neck, and its head was not exceptionally large. Face was not seen, but hair covered the whole body and was very long. The hair on the arms was described as hanging and very evident. In the headlights, he could not truly discern a color, but it may have been gray. My informant said it retreated very quickly. He felt it had tried to beat the car, but misjudged their speed. He has avoided that spot ever since. My sister, Natalie, and I decided to take the four-wheeler out after dark against my father's words. We followed the trail from our property into the McMillan Marsh. There, we were able to run along a dike system between water reservoirs. It was midwinter, and my sister, Nats, was driving the four-wheeler, and I was riding shotgun behind her along the dike. It was lightly snowing. Dark grew in fast and we were suddenly surrounded by darkness and snow with two headlights to show the way. Suddenly, a large seven to eight foot creature walked up onto the dike in front of us about 50 yards away. It stopped, turned, and looked right at us. We both noticed how the wind blew the long light brown hair, about a foot long, on its side apart, and it was white underneath as the hair parted from the wind. Our four-wheeler knights were not high enough to see the face, but it had a large muscular chest and arms and walked like a man. The chest was a little more hairless so that you could see rippling muscles under the dark hair. It had very long arms and did not walk like a human. It sauntered along, totally unafraid of us, it swaggered with very long arms swinging at its sides and then went off the dike and into the wilderness. We were shocked and horrified. We sat in shock and then throttled over where its location was. There were very large footprints in the snow. We hurried home and never told a soul until years later. We compared what we saw and our stories were exact. We will never forget that night. It was not a wolf, a bear, or anything human. I stand by that with my soul. If it were just me, I would have blown it off as a figment, but Natalie has every detail to the exact of my own. This is a report from the wife of a guy I work with. This is my first report since being a Bigfoot researcher. Here is the story as it was told to me. Around 15 years ago, me and my friend 
were horseback riding alongside the FEC railroad tracks between SR-207 and King's Estate Road. We were heading south towards King Estate Road when we noticed a smell like something was dead. I thought maybe it was a hog or something that died in the woods. We heard branches breaking like something was in the woods, but didn't pay much attention to it. Then, the horses started to act up. Horses were blowing and snorting and rearing, and I just thought that they were being bad and difficult. As we passed that area, the horses acted better, and we went on down the side of the track still heading south. When I heard the sound of the rocks on the side of the track sound like someone was walking up on them, I told the friend I was with, don't walk the horses on the rocks, and he said I'm not. Just then, I turned to look around. She was just behind me to see what it was. That's when we saw it. It was about 150 yards away from us where we just passed. But standing in the middle of the railroad tracks, it was in some sort of crouched position and not all the way down. Like it just saw us and froze and stared at us. What I saw was slim and covered in reddish brown hair it had long arms and I could see the eyes a little. It was at least six and a half feet tall and around 250 pounds or better with no neck. It was getting dark out so we couldn't see any detail on the face. All the time that we saw it, we had to fight the horses to keep them under control. They didn't want any part of whatever it was and neither did we. So we got out of there and I never went back riding there again. It wasn't a bear. And it wasn't a man, unless he was covered in hair from head to toe. Here is the story, as well as I can remember it, approximately 27 years ago, around 1983. Now, if my memory serves me right, this incident happened during the summer of 1983. We lived on Homestead Air Force Base, Florida, and my spouse had just been transferred overseas right after the birth of our child, and I was waiting to move overseas with him once he was settled. So, the approximate time had to be around mid-July through September 1983. Additionally, I cannot remember exactly whether a hurricane was approaching or it had just passed our area, but it was around this time. But fortunately, I do remember that the hurricane did change its course and headed up north along the eastern coastline, bypassing our area. This could help establish the time frame and verify when this incident occurred and to perhaps acquire a copy of the television news report, if one was still available. My mother recently deceased, had traveled down up from the north to visit and help out. Now both my mom and I were watching the local news when the news station reported that a horse was killed near the Everglades, on or near some farm. The place where this occurred was by the southern Everglades area, bordered nearby the base. The news report televised showed the horse's head completely torn off of its body, ripped apart from the horse's body like a piece of paper. The horse's body was intact and so was the head. The horse's head was just lying there separated from the body. The horse's body showed no signs of scratch or claw marks, chain marks, etc. An investigator, scientist, or biologist cannot recall what the exact credentials were, stated that he believed it could have been possibly done by a Bigfoot who perhaps suffered some sort of personal loss, its mate dying, for example. Also being reported and shown was that there were no signs of other tracks, tires, or heavy equipment eliminating the possibility that the horse was mutilated by some sort of machinery or killed and dumped there as to seek some sort of retaliation to the owner of the horse. The investigator did point to a very large footprint in close proximity in the mud, which was reported and shown on air also. A friend of my wife told us about one of their friends who had an encounter. 
I got in touch with him and he agreed to relate his experience. I was very interested since it occurred in my backyard, in Sulphur Canyon, off the Caribou Basin, south of Soda Springs, Idaho. It was mid-late November of 1967 or 1968. He was on a late deer hunt with some companions on snowmobiles. Heavy snow was falling, but it was calm. The man had shot a deer and was dragging it back to the snowmobile, when across the canyon, he could just make out a figure coming down the slope about one-fourth mile distant. He thought it was his friend, a big guy, coming to help with the deer. It continued to approach and he left the deer laying in the snow to walk down to meet his friend. The figure didn't seem to notice him until it was within about 35 yards. Then it saw him and stopped with a look of surprise and an oh shit expression on his face. It had human-like features and a look of intelligence. Not like going to the zoo and looking at a monkey. It stood very erect, was six and a half feet to seven feet tall, and was covered with a silver coyote colored fur about three inches long, longer on the backs of the arms. He felt no threat from the creature and both turned and retreated out of sight. He emphasized that Hugh had spent a lot of time in the woods and he knows what he saw. A Mrs. Ruth Steele believes she has seen a Sasquatch three times in the past six months at Dory and Dryad along River Road. Farms are scattered throughout the semi-forested area and she drives the road nearly every evening. Steele described them as gray, white, and sometimes black, fur-covered, and about seven feet tall. The faces of the upright animal appear to be pink skin. Her first sighting occurred in 1996, and was a dirty white creature six or seven feet tall. The most recent was in January of 1997, and the animal turned and looked at her car with eyes that shone red. Steele was accompanied by her daughter, Deborah Steele, 41, last November when the latter saw a creature loping along by the road swinging one arm. It looked right at her and scared her badly. Steele thinks they are migrating toward her home because each sighting is closer to where she lives. I live in Alpine, Utah. I have lived here my whole life. It's a small valley surrounded by the Wasatch Mountain. My encounter happened when I was 19 years old, right before I left on a LDS mission for the Church of Jesus Christ on Latter-day Saints. There is a canyon no more than 10 minutes from where I live. It's called American Fork Canyon. I was with two of my great friends who have also served LDS missions. I was about to leave for two years. I love the outdoors, but I wanted to spend my last couple of days camping up American Fork Canyon with my friends. It was Friday, June 27, 2008. We found a place to camp a little bit north of Tibble Fork Lake. It's very peaceful and calm. It was getting dark and we just finished up fishing. My good friend Austin Hansen went to set up the fire while his brother Alex and I went to the river below to clean off the fish. I remember Austin later that night telling us he saw someone walking in the brush by all of our camping gear. He didn't say anything. He just saw a big figure. He thought it was someone looking for something near our campsite. We came back and started cooking the fresh fish we just caught. We sat down, started talking about girls, our future, and while we were there talking, we heard a faint, eerie whistling noise. We didn't think much of it, maybe thinking it was some kind of weird bird in the trees. Maybe we had camped too close to its nest and we were bothering its family. It was a far off distant sound. At times, it sounded like it was behind a bush listening to us. The closer it got, there was also a weird smell that accompanied it. It also felt to all of us that the eyes were on us. Curious eyes watching and listening. 
as if we didn't belong in this area. As we were getting ready for bed, I walked off maybe 10 yards to where we were going to be sleeping to go to the bathroom. I thought I saw someone maybe 40 yards away. It was walking right behind two big pine trees and it stayed there for no longer than 30 seconds. Then I heard a stick at a tree two times, but the sound was coming off from the northeast from where I was standing. That's when I saw it. Whatever you want to call it, but I know what I saw. I saw Sasquatch standing upright walking towards the tree. It was standing at least seven feet tall, not intimidated by any means. It looked at me, or in my direction. My heart was pounding as the whistling noise got loud, very loud. I ran back to camp, telling my friends what I just saw. They believed me, telling me they felt the same way as if they were being watched. Austin told us the event earlier, seeing a huge man walking away from our camp. We got our things together and ran to the car. That late Friday night, and is something that I will never forget as long as I live. I was told this story 20 or more years ago by my mother who passed away May 2006. It came up in conversation during which we were not discussing Bigfoot, but she retold a story that my grandfather had told her and her siblings 65 or 70 years earlier, roughly between 1916 and 1921. My grandfather and grandmother were Greek immigrants that worked in the fruit canneries in the Central Valley in California and my grandfather worked many years for the Southern Pacific Railroad, doing track maintenance and building railroad track. My mother told a story that was refuted by her and her siblings when my grandfather told it. These were children of the early 1900s going to school by and trilingual. As my mother told it, when grandpa told the story, they were convinced that he was telling a tall tale, primarily because they all learned in school that there were no apes in North America. The story goes, Grandpa was working for Southern Pacific Railroad building track in the Northern California, Oregon border area in the early 1900s. I do not know the year during this work project. He was dispatched to work on line camp in the woods. They had a base that the work crew worked from and each week the work crews would split into two man teams that would work on an area clearing logs and ground at the end of one week they would go back to the base to check in and replenish their supplies and then set out for the weekend for another week in the woods. During this time one of the two man teams came back to base with only one man. They were told that the other man had disappeared. The group at the base camp apparently gave a brief search but to no avail. The next week the crews went out in two-man crews and continued to work on the railroad line clearing. Some weeks later, I am not sure how long this was, as the camp moved north and the group of railroad workers came upon the missing man. He was naked and hysterical and crazed, and apparently died soon after he was found. He told of being abducted by a female ape that kept him in a large open pit. During the time he was in the pit, the man told of being forced to have sexual contact with the ape many times and said that the ape kept him in the hole or pit by licking his hands and feet raw so that he was not able to escape from the pit. Apparently, my grandfather saw this man's hands and feet and they were completely raw. My mother and her sisters and brothers laughed at my grandfather as someone who was uneducated and unable to understand that this was implausible due to the fact that there are no apes in North America. I always found this to be intriguing. Uh, has anybody reported a similar story? My mom told me the story of her sighting of Bigfoot when her and my father were on their way to my aunt and uncle's house somewhere on the outskirts of Ada, Oklahoma in the late 1950s before I was born. It was just the two of them traveling down a dark country road 
when my mom says that she saw this elusive creature making its way across the road. On the passenger side of the road, and that within a blink of her eyes it was gone, my dad completely missed the sighting. She said that it seemed to look over at them, toward the car, and hurriedly made its way down the embankment until it disappeared into the thicket. Every now and then I still ask my mom about what she remembers seeing that night, and her story remains the same. She described it as being a large hairy creature that walked upright with extremely long arms that swung from side to side as it steadily made its way into the woods. This story, like so many others, confirms in my mind that it is fact and not fiction, but it continues to be just as mysterious today as it has for so many years now. When it's your mom telling the story, you know that there is something very real out there that has been able to evade us for centuries and continues to elude most of the human population with only those occasional rare sightings that keeps the rest of us wondering what it is or if it's actually real. As for me, it is still a mystery, but I do believe my mom saw the creature that the rest of us have only heard of, and I happen to hear about it firsthand. In 1980 and 1981, I was working as a security guard on a high-tension tower project here in California. I met a man who was a cat skinner operating a bulldozer, leveling off the pads where each of these high-tension towers was to be placed. I noted he had on his pickup truck 25 to 30 decals from places he had been hunting and introduced myself. During the conversation, I mentioned Bigfoot, and he told me that in mid to late 1970, he was doing a little poaching with the forestry official's permission in a locked and gated area near Bishop, California. They had given him a key so he could go in anytime he wanted. This particular time, the gate was still locked, as it always was. He let himself in and his four-wheel drive pickup to the area known as Four Points. He drove over a hill, and there, to his surprise, were a department of the Interior Vehicles and Bureau of Land Management men, all in their Smokey the Bear outfits with guns, searching a campground, the hills, the mountains, roads, etc. They grabbed this hunter, took his deer rifle away from him, and questioned him for seven to eight hours as to what he was doing there. The local forestry officials identified him as a trusted friend and he was let go, but told to never come back. He had determined during his interrogation that the reason the BLM and Department of Interior were there in force was that a Bigfoot creature had gone through there the day before, had torn up the campground, had turned over a large trash container, the type that you find behind large department stores, you know, kind of like dumpsters that no man can even begin to move and had killed several people. Over the years, the story was passed through several people. Quite a few Bigfoot researchers, but no one was able to come up with a single clue. Then, in early to mid-1991, a young student also interested in investigating the Bigfoot mystery called the CBFO's hotline to tell me that he had heard the story several years ago and it had always stuck with him. He went on to relate that when he was doing some Bigfoot research in the town of Bishop, California, Inyo County area in 1989 and 1990, he met a former policeman who said that he was on the Bishop Police Force in the mid to late 1970s. The student related that foregoing story of Bigfoot to the ex-police officer from Bishop and he confirmed it. The officer said that the story was the talk of the law enforcement agencies in that area at the time but they were under tight orders not to say anything about the incident and related deaths. My name is Cheryl, a Mohawk Indian who grew up on the Onondaga Indian Reservation. I'll never forget when my cousin and I saw Bigfoot. 
We were both 11 years old on March 11th, 1975, at 11 a.m. We left my aunt's house that morning and decided to cut through the woods, thinking it would be safer than two girls walking along the road. Throughout our walk, it seemed that we were being watched. We finally arrived at the halfway point of our journey when we reached the local abandoned gravel pits. I slid down the embankment first and my cousin followed. I started to play on the frozen mud puddle when she started to climb back up the hill to retrieve her glove. She called for me to come near her but didn't right away until finally her persistence frightened me. She grabbed me close and said a big black arm just tried to grab me. Thinking that maybe a hunter had followed us or even a black man was lurking in the woods frightened us enough to make a run for the road. As we got to the road, we both saw this big figure walk through six to eight foot sumac trees. Its head and shoulders were over the tops of the trees, and we could imagine how it could have traveled to the other side of the pit, which was at least 150 feet from where she first saw the arm. We ran the rest of the way home and told our family we had seen Sasquatch. Of course, everyone laughed at us. As the years passed by, we told the exact same story and our families believe us now. Looking back, I have concluded that Bigfoot was heading towards an underground cave that is sacred to the Onondaga. I believe that this cave connects other Indian reservations by underground channels. Indian legends tell stories that Bigfoot is a spirit that protects the Indians. That is probably why no one has ever found any proof of its existence. I have had many dreams about Bigfoot. I had been out hunting and started back to the pickup since it was getting dark. I was following the railroad tracks when I heard something walking behind me. Thinking it was a bear, I stopped and looked back to the west and noticed it was walking on two legs, moving back into the woods. After a minute or so, I started walking to the east again, a little faster now. I had gone about 50 yards when it started throwing rocks at me. By now I was getting spooked and broke into a run. It was keeping up with me, moving through thick vines and briars, and I was on the tracks. When I made it back to the truck, I got in and sat there a few minutes. I didn't see it anymore, so I drove home. The thing looked like a very large human, but had fur like a bear. It was about seven feet tall with a long torso and long arms. It was dark color, but hard to tell for sure looking back into the sunset. My cousins and I were spotlighting one night to find coyotes. We were driving alongside a tree line when we spotted eyes shining in the light about 150 feet away from the trees. I had binoculars, and one of my cousins had a 22 Magnum with a scope. We had a very good view of a large biped covered with brown hair, except for white patches on the pecs, or chest, and one of its arms. It was about 8 feet tall or more. It tilted its head down because of the light, but stayed in place for about five minutes, then stepped across the fence on the tree line and disappeared into the woods. The face was like a man and an ape. I was bow hunting and was ready to climb down and heard a noise and figured it was a deer so I decided to stay because I had a light so I got really quiet and all of a sudden I heard a tree being broken and right away I knew it was not a noise I had heard in my 20 plus years of hunting so I decided not to move at all actually I could smell a scent that was unfamiliar to me and right away something was strange then I got the feeling of being watched and felt like I was intruding on something that did not want me there a tree began to shake, a really big tree about 6 inches in diameter. Then something came flying by me. I think it was a rock. Then I looked in the direction the rock or whatever it was came from and was paralyzed with fear but never really felt threatened and everything was silent. 
And there it was, something standing upright, and had hair hanging from it like a dog has hanging down from his belly. And it took one step, and made a sound I can't even describe. And then the woods came back to life, and I got my ass out of there. And I have never been hunting again anywhere. I sold all of my equipment and will never go back in the woods again. If I do, I will be heavily armed. It was about one mile from my home. I will not let my dog go outside without me or my wife watching them. And we always have a 40 cal gun where we can get to very fast. It has made my life miserable. I wish I had never seen that. This thing ruined my life. I scouted the area the day before and hung my old man climbing tree stand on a tree for the following morning's hunt. The only tree I could use was a small oak with a main fork that was about 12 feet off the ground and covered with poison oak. That means I could only climb up that fork and not my usual 20 or 25 feet which I usually like to hunt from. I'm not allergic to poison oak so that wasn't going to bother me. I arrived early about 4.45 a.m., parked and got dressed. I've learned that to be a successful hunter, you have to be scent free. I dressed in my real tree leafy suit and lacrosse rubber boots, sprayed down the scent killer and doused my boots with persimmon scent and walked to my stand at about 5 a.m. The moon was full and I could see with the use of my streamlight. With the morning dew, I made no noise getting to my stand and without scaring game off with a large flashlight. I made it to my stand and found that the top of the portion was twisted around to the back of the tree and the bottom was moved to the base of the tree. Why did someone do this and not steal it? I was up to the tree and had my bow in my lap with my arrow pointing away from me with it resting on my stand's gun rest. I pulled out my earth scent wafers and attached them to the outside of my backpack. I was facing south with two big oak trees about 25 yards away. The clouds were moving fast with the full moon. I could somewhat see in the dark. I was very still and had everything camouflaged except my muzzy broadhead and the end of my arrow. It was about 5.30 a.m. when I heard something walk up from behind me. I turned slowly to see if I could see it. It was big and black and at first I thought it was a couple hogs. They were too big to be hogs, and I wondered whose cows were loose in the refuge. I was wanting them to hurry up and leave so they wouldn't scare the deer, when something brushed up against my leg. I didn't hear anything climb up the tree with me, so I kept still. I was looking forward, then I saw a big, black hand reach up and grab my muzzy broadhead. The hand was a shiny black, and the fingers were huge. The palms were also black like a gorilla. When it grabbed my broadhead, the razor blades cut him and it yelled like a bull. It was louder than a car horn and it was at my feet. It scared the crap out of me so I started to yell back and cussing. It ran off breaking the trees and tearing down everything in its path. I sat there for 15 minutes until it got daylight and left. I believe that I scared him or her as much as it scared me. On April the 17th of 2004, I was turkey hunting in the Washita National Forest about four miles west from Big Cedar, Oklahoma, with my girlfriend and my brother. I had crossed the creek that ran alongside the old log road that headed up the mountain to the west when I decided to hunt the creek bottom that afternoon. As I set up my turkey blind and got settled in to do some hunting, I blew one of my locator calls. It was a screaming hawk. After sitting there for about 15 minutes, I turned my head and noticed a burnt looking tree about 50 yards to my left. I raised my shotgun and looked at it with my scope. When I realized that what I was seeing was not a tree, but a large creature like I had never seen before. It stood about eight feet tall, had charcoal dark colored hair covering its entire body. It was about three inches long and coarse in appearance. It was watching me as I was watching it. Its eyes were reddish brown in color. 
It had long arms and walked upright and never taking its eyes off me. And I never took my eyes off of it. I have never been scared of anything in the woods, but this thing was massive in size. And I can say this thing scared me. And I have not been back in the woods before daylight since. I had my deer, my kill, stolen by a beast I did not even notice was literally 50 to 60 yards away from me while hunting outside of Hobart Bay, Alaska. I was born and raised in Oregon, Salem to be exact. I am an avid hunter and outdoorsman if you will, and what I saw blew me away and it changed my life for good in some ways. I am a business owner in Salem, Oregon, where I was born and raised. It is not often that I share this encounter because I do not want to ruin my business, but I figured if my name is kept out of it, I could share it with you guys. I love to hunt and fish. Bear, elk, cougar, pronghorn, and eastern Oregon, you name it. I love to hunt and fish. As a matter of fact, up until the day or event in my life, I had hunted all over the United States. Alaska was the next destination. I am telling you, I could have had my own Netflix show like The Meat Eater Guy. It was a year of overpopulation back in the mid-90s when my friend called me to inform me that there were going to be extra out-of-state tags given for hunting Sitka black-tailed deer. Apparently, there was a population explosion and it was becoming a nuisance to the locals throughout the southern part of Alaska. So, with that good news and cheaper tags, I was in. I was going to visit my good friend for a four to five day hunt around Hobart Bay, Alaska that year. My favorite thing to hunt is deer. I know for some it seems like the most boring, as it is not as dangerous as a mountain lion or a bear. Personally, I like deer because they really are hard to hunt, especially as a bow hunter. I have to get closer, which means the bow hunter has to be stealthier. I would fly into Alaska where my buddy would pick me up, and we would stay at his cabin just on the outskirts of a little old sleepy logging town called Hobart Bay. Personally, today, I think the main industry of that town is tourism, as I believe the logging industry has been closed down. Fishing, hunting, hiking, and basically just all the outdoor sports and recreation you could think of is available there. I still go back there even after seeing this animal. I never really believe existed come out of the brush and steal my kill that day. But let me tell you everything that happened and exactly what I saw and experienced that day. Jack's cabin was a two-bedroom, one large living room, and open kitchen log cabin. To tell you the truth, it was a little swanky for a hunter who lived in the wilds of Alaska. Then again, Jack was married and his wife liked the swanky feel. They were both actually early retirees from Idaho originally. They hit the jackpot with some work at a home-based business they had for 12 years, and still to this day collect a very large monthly income from it. But in the end, Jack and his wife loved the country life, and that is the one thing they always wanted to do, to live in Alaska in a cabin once their son and daughter were off to college. I loved it there too. The hunting trip was the first of many I would go on with Jack, and that second bedroom would become a second home for me over time. Just so you know, I did marry myself, but she passed away before our 10th anniversary from cancer. I never remarried, even to this day, by the time this incident happened, she had been gone for four years, and yes, I was still feeling the pain and loss pretty badly. It was nice to get out of Salem and into a cabin up in Alaska at the time. It was nearing that time of year, and I think you know what I'm referring to, the anniversary, and I simply did not want to be alone. Arriving at the cabin was really a breath of fresh air, and as you can tell, it was much needed. Jack and his wife helped me get settled in that late afternoon I arrived. It was of course a little too late for hunting that day, and the trip was long, so we simply enjoyed playing catch up with our lives that evening over dinner and dessert. The conversation on the porch later that evening would turn into hunting the Sitka black-tailed deer. We also talked about safety with so many bears around, while Hobart Bay is small, and where we would hunt about 10 miles southeast, there were bears everywhere all the time. We would of course be strapped with large caliber handguns as well as bear spray, Funny thing was, who would have thought that Bigfoot spray would be something I would need instead? 
I know they don't make it, it was just a bit of humor and sarcasm all at the same time. It is not the subject that never came up in my life. As a matter of fact, I had a couple of friends down in southern Oregon who had come across what they believed was Bigfoot, and one of them was in a law enforcement down there. He watched as it took down a deer. He will share that with you soon. I never was thoroughly convinced of its existence, but I did leave room for it, and even though, and even thought about it, when I was out hunting, it's not like I never looked for more than deer track while I was out there. Hey, you never know, right? But I know, you want the encounter, not all that other stuff that leads up to it. I just wanted you to know why I was up there in the first place, and how this truly shaped my life moving forward. The sighting and encounter did not last long, so I will try to keep it as short as possible. Truth be told, the event or incident took no longer than 35 to 40 seconds tops. However, it felt like minutes passed by instead. I guess when you see something like that, time just gets lost, I supposed. Where we were hunting was more or less a high country type of landscape. There are quite a few different types of landscapes in Alaska, and here it was the smaller coniferous trees that dotted the land, but it was the tall, thick brush that cut down on visibility. Here you had to take the high ground to hunt, or you could not be able to see a thing hardly. Of course, finding high ground in Alaska, even around the salt chuck, was not all that complicated. When we arrived, I told Jack how right he was, this part of Alaska was really beautiful. It was so beautiful in fact, I started thinking I could live here, and even daydreamed about it for a while, hunting that morning. It was just getting light, and the low-lying hills were shadowed by a mountain range to the east. We walked to the bush about 200 yards or so, beyond the dirt road we parked on. Actually, every road there was dirt at the time, and so were most of the little town of Hobart Bay. We decided to spread out, so I walked west about another 200 yards and settled in for what I hoped would be a decent day of hunting, or what some call patiently waiting. Armed with my bow and a small bag of food and one tall thermos of coffee, I finally found a little knoll with the perfect view of the valley below. Looking around, there were a ton of deer sign, so the prospects were great, I thought. At one point, I believe I saw some black bear tracks on the way in but things were still damp from the rain earlier that morning, so I could not be sure. They were fresh tracks, so I would keep myself aware. I poured a cup of coffee and got settled in near a little rocky outcropping, and then took out my binoculars to get a better lay of the land below. There was a light fog through the small valley below, but nothing that was hindering my view within the range of my bow. Nothing. I saw nothing and heard nothing, but the birds chirping for two hours. Twice, I had to relieve myself of the coffee I was drinking, and usually, as a hunter, you would just let it go without moving much. However, because there was nothing around apparently, I decided to jump over to a nearby tree and real quick to relieve myself. Impressions, again. I was peeing when I noticed more of those large bear impressions about three or four feet to the right of me near the trees. They were long, wide, and because of the heavy rain later in the night, or earlier that morning, I had the feeling that it came through here not even an hour or two ago. With that revelation, I decided to radio over to Jack at least to let him know. Better to be safe than sorry. The impressions led from south to north, basically over the edge of the knoll I was on, and down into the small valley below. I guess we were not the only hunters slash predators out there that morning. I got back to my spot, and that is when Jack radioed me back, telling me that he had not seen a thing all morning and wanted to know if I wanted to move down to the road about three miles away. He said there was a nice little ravine almost overlooking the same valley below. Only a better view, as the ravine was higher and the game trails were plenty. Of course, game trails were the magic phrase for me. That did it, twenty minutes later we were pulling over and packing our hunting equipment to a new spot. We were patient hunters, trust me, but when it's just dead with no moving around, it's time to move. We were there to hunt, not drink coffee and eat sandwiches all day. There was another but larger rocky outcropping in the section of the ridge. This one stretched for about 30 or 40 yards, so we took one side and I took the other. I would keep my line of sight and area northwest and he would face the northeast, and from time to time we would agree to look dead center. This area had taller trees, and more of them, and thicker brush. However, the brush was not as tall, 
so seeing something moving through would be easier. However, what I was about to see, well, I wish sometimes I could unsee. But then again, other times I'm feeling rather lucky to have witnessed such a creature. After about 20 minutes, Jack decided to move further down, about another 45 to 50 yards, putting him then about 150 or so yards away. More game trails equaled more sign, and that more sign equaled more movement, and not even 25 minutes into our own move to the new location. It was a few or so females, and the young, more or less small herd, it would not be long now, as every hunter knows, bucks follow the hinds, and they're usually not too far behind. I started to get real excited and settled in a bit. I drew my bow out and made sure I was ready to let an arrow fly. Another 15 minutes and finally, through a small clearing, I saw the first buck of the day. Well, late late morning by then. It was a four point buck, I could see. I was approximately 25 yards away, where he came a heavy thicket of bush and smaller shore pines, and a few taller black pines. As a bow hunter, even if you are using feeders, you are never more than around 30 yards away from your kill zone. That golden brown and perfect Sitka black deer had come into almost full view at that point. I settled down, relaxed a bit, and breathed in and out once or twice as usual, and took aim. Right above the front shoulder, that was the usual pavement. Right above the front shoulder, that was the usual placement, and the best really for any bow hunter. The arrow is in the air and a split second later, it was a great shot. The deer jumped and spun around and before then it hit a tree and fell down. I did not stand up yet. Actually, I fell to both knees and watched as it slowly stopped moving. And that is when I heard something massive crashing through the bush and trees from about 20 yards or so from the north side of where the deer now laid next to a black pine. Enormous, massive, and downright scary looking from what I could tell. I knew right out the gate that I was looking at a Bigfoot. It was fast too. It came out of the brush and was on all fours. In front of the deer, before I knew it, there it was. A myth, a legend, alive before my eyes. It was a brownish color. The hair that is, and no, it was not fur. It looked like hair to me, of course, there was still some brush in the way but I could see that this thing had to be on all fours. That was what was so amazing and scary. To be on all fours like that, well, if it were a bear, even a large one, I would not be able to see much of it behind that low brush like that, especially when on all fours. The head was not totally cone-shaped, but there was a bit of a shape to it. The hair, like I said, was more of a brownish color, but not dark brown, more like that deer, but only a few shades darker. I could not get a real sense of its face, other than it was darker and almost a dark grey cover tone to it. For the most part, all I could see was massive amounts of hair covering a huge monster of the woods. It was muscular and had broad shoulders. If I had to guess, I would put that thing about 4 feet wide at the chest, nearly 9 feet tall, and had to weigh at least 500 pounds. It stood up with my deer in both of its large hands. At this moment, I got a sense that this Bigfoot was, at all of that, eight to nine feet in height. Anyways, it had my kill in its hands and then snap. A cracking or breaking noise could be heard from where it was at. I watched as the creature literally and practically ripped the head off the deer as easily as you could twist a cap off of a beer. Next, it looked back the way it had come and made a short whistle sound. What freaked me out at that point was the fact that a whistle came back. There were more than one of these things. It looked around, even in my direction for a moment and still as a church mouse in the dark. It looked back to where the other whistle came from, tossed the deer over its shoulder, and with one arm, and with the longest strides I had ever seen, disappeared into the thick brush and trees. I packed up a few things that were out of my backpack, and made my way quietly back towards Jack. I am not sure if he would believe me, but either way, I wanted to be as far away from here as I could at that moment. Jack was not surprised, but I... Jack was not surprised, but I was because of his lack of being surprised. The conversation never came up because he thought I would never have believed him about his own sighting four years earlier. It was further north of Hobart Bay, and he had one nonetheless. I joked with him about being upset for a minute, but what had just happened as we drove away was scary and amazing all at once. Jack's description was almost spot on with mine, even down to the color of the thing. 
However, his happened while fishing in a stream. It was scooping up fish of the stream and eating them until it was noticed. At that point, it walked off and disappeared into the woods as well. Well, at least I know I was not seeing things. Since then, I've hunted in Hobart Bay, hoping I will get a chance to see this giant thing of a creature again. Well, as long as it was at least from 30 yards away for sure. I also do a little research from time to time myself in Oregon. This sighting changed me and my beliefs about what is out there in the Pacific Northwest after all. Let me start off by saying that this is a story that I've never told anybody. This encounter happened in the woods of southern New Jersey. My girlfriend, her sister Shelley, her boyfriend Craig and I decided to take a two-day camping trip in the woods. It was a hour drive from our apartment in Philadelphia without traffic, so we woke up early in the morning to beat the traffic and to avoid a three and a half hour drive. We arrived in Burlington, New Jersey, and stopped off at the Acme grocery store and brought chicken, bread, hot dogs, a case of water, and a few other snacks for us to live off for the two-day adventure. We took a back road towards the rural area of the country which was close to the military base. We arrived at our destination and wasted no time getting out of the car. The area was a wasteland, no cars passing the turn off and nobody parked anywhere. Nothing at all. It was completely quiet. I immediately got the feeling of dread, but tried to suppress it to prevent ruining our trip. We spent the next half hour finding a perfect spot to set up our camp. We ended up picking a spot near a clearing that was by a service road and a line of telephone poles. We set up camp as nightfall came quick. My girlfriend and her sister set up the tent as me and Craig built the fire and put chairs around the fire. By the time we were finished, it was already 9pm since we arrived around roughly 7pm. As we sat around the fire, I got up to take a piss behind a tree about 20 yards behind the tent. As I was doing my business, the woods fell dead silent. All activity was gone. No crickets or bird calls, just complete silence. I began to get that feeling of dread again. As I finished up, I began to feel a presence, as if something was watching me. I walked back to the campsite and asked them if they noticed how the area suddenly fell silent. They looked at me like I was crazy and brushed it off as a common trait of the wilderness. We sat out talking and laughing until about 12 midnight. Then we hit the tent for the night. I laid next to my girlfriend, closest to the mesh window, which was open. After about 30 minutes of just lying there, I began to doze off. I was just about to fall asleep until I was startled by a deer running at full speed through our campsite. At the time, it didn't seem too odd, so I just brushed it off, thinking it ran through here fast just to avoid contact with us. After calming down from the sudden rush of adrenaline, I finally managed to fall back asleep. At about 2.30 a.m., I was awoken by my girlfriend who was frantically shaking me. She was bug-eyed and pale as snow. I sat up trying to calm her down to find out what the problem was. At this point, Shelly and Craig were wide awake, confused about the whole commotion going on. My girlfriend finally calmed down and began to tell me that something was moving around off into the woods, letting off growls. My first initial thought was that it was a bear she heard. Craig and myself grabbed our guns and exited the tent and walked around the perimeter. The woods were still, dead, silent. We walked around for about 15 minutes and after finding nothing, we headed back to the tent and told the girls that it was nothing more than a deer passing through the area. We all managed to fall asleep but I was awoken 20 minutes later to sounds off in the brush. It sounded like something walking back and forth, off in the trees. I looked out the mesh window, but saw nothing, just darkness. I woke Craig up quietly to avoid waking up the girls. I told him about the sounds I was hearing off in the brush. We sat there, just listening. 
It sounded like it was about 15 yards away, and it was inching closer. That's when we heard the grunts. These were deep, guttural, aggressive grunts. Whatever this thing was, it was big. The footsteps sounded as if it was on two feet. So at first, I thought it was a homeless man, or a hermit drunk off his ass. Soon after that thought, the sound stopped. Everything was quiet once again. At this moment, I grabbed my Glock 17 semi-automatic pistol and cocked it back and laid back down. Soon after that, that's when it happened. We were all hit by a blood-curdling roar. This roar was so loud and strong, I felt my organs vibrating. The girls were immediately awoken by the roar, and it stopped as soon as it started. I was insanely terrified at this point. In the midst of this creature roaring, I subconsciously grabbed my gun, and I was gripping it tightly with a death grip. Craig went outside of the tent first, while my girlfriend and Shelly closed the mesh windows. I got out of the tent, and I was hit with a gut-wrenching smell. It was horrible. My stomach began to turn as I fought the urge to puke. I smell it as I'm typing this right now. We began to walk around the edge of the woods with our guns fixed on the darkness, not knowing what the hell was out there. I reached the spot where I had previously took a leak, and just then, a tree branch came flying over our heads, crashing into the chairs where the fire was. Then once again, a loud roar. This one lasted a lot shorter than the last one. Craig immediately began to fire his gun in the direction of the roar, with me soon joining him. I fired three shots and stopped when I saw Craig stop. We heard fast-paced, heavy footsteps coming towards us. I took ten steps back, turned around and ran back to the tent where the girls were. I told them we need to get out of here, immediately. I looked up from the tent and saw Craig staring into the brush while slowly walking backwards towards us. I looked into the same direction as he was, and that's when I saw it. Standing about eight and a half feet tall was this huge, dark figure. This thing was muscular. There was enough moonlight breaking through the trees to see the definitions of its arms and chest. It was all black with shiny black fur. It had red, glowing eyes. I pushed the girls back inside the tent and told them to shut it. I looked up back over the tent and it was staring right at me while Craig was standing right next to me. At this moment, I made the biggest mistake. I sat there, staring right into its eyes for about 10 seconds as it let off another roar. My body trembled with fear but was soon replaced with adrenaline and anger. I raised my gun and aimed it at the creature's chest. Craig immediately put his hand on my shoulder, telling me, I don't think that gun is big enough. It then hit me. He was right. This thing was the size of a linebacker on steroids. The creature then started to motion towards us. I fired in its direction to warn it to not come any closer, but it ignored it. I fired a second time, with no success. I then got agitated and fired three shots at this thing's chest. All three hit this creature in the chest. I'm a marksman with 83% accuracy rate, so I know for a fact that I hit this thing. The creature then scrunched its face and gave a growl. At this point, it was standing in the open and was illuminated by the moonlight. I got a clear look at this thing. It had the face of a human, but it had no neck. Its head connected right at its shoulders. It again began to motion towards us. I reloaded my gun and raised it. Craig then also raised his 45 automatic pistol. I began to yell at this thing to not come any closer. It was about 15 yards away when it began to growl again, and Craig fired six shots at this thing. I joined him and let off five shots at its chest once again. It then stumbled back, fell to the ground, and took off into the woods. 
I wasted no time grabbing the girls and telling them we needed to go now. Luckily, the car was only about 50 yards from our campsite. We ran through the bush at full speed. I could hear something keeping pace with us off in the distance on our left side, so I began to fire into that direction while running like my life depended on it. I kept my girlfriend to the right of me until we finally reached the car. She threw me the keys and I hopped in, started the car and peeled out of there, speeding down the dirt track towards the main road. I looked in my rearview mirror and saw this thing gaining on us. I put the pedal to the floor and was doing 70 down the dirt road. It was about 50 or 60 yards behind us, keeping pace until it suddenly stopped and turned off back into the woods. I reached the service road and turned left without checking for any cars. I drove straight home after this. The car ride was silent until Craig broke it asking, what in the bloody hell was that thing? Shelley then replied saying it was a bear. I immediately shot that down by explaining to her the description of this thing. Her eyes grew wide. Since that day, I've never gone camping and I don't plan on doing so ever again. This experience has left me traumatized. I to this day have nightmares about that creature. I did research and saw that Bigfoot matched the description of this creature to a T. I thought Bigfoot was a little far-fetched, but I had no idea what this thing could have been. To this day, all I can say was, thank goodness I had Craig with me and that we were armed. I have now become a full believer of Bigfoot after this encounter.